Take a look at the middle of Siberia on the map, the space lying by the Yenisei River. This region, called Krasnoyarsk, has many natural areas. In the south, where a Bakken flows into the Yenisei, no worse than in the Astrakhan steppes, watermelons, melons, and tomatoes ripen. Siberian Italy, they sometimes say about these places. In the north, where the Yenisei is already turning into the sea, reindeer get scanty food under the snow and people live exclusively on what can be obtained from reindeer breeding. Thousands of kilometers from south to north, steppe, forest steppe, wide taiga belt, forest tundra, polar zone. We write a lot about the development of this region. And it has already been mastered fairly. But is it any wonder that there are also bearish corners, white spots, inevitable and untouched places? The place of our interest lies in the south of Siberia, in Caucasia, where the Altai Mountains meet the Siam ridges. Find the initial tail of the Abakan River, put a mark on its right bank as a keepsake, this is the place we were striving for and from where we had difficulty getting out later. In its young years, the earth was pleased to mix, to confuse the mountain ridges here, that the place became extremely inaccessible. There is no road or even a bearable path here. A barely perceptible trail hidden by the taiga is suitable for communicating strong, hardy people and even then with some risk. From the report of the geological expedition. To penetrate here, you need to overcome several barriers, each of which becomes higher and steeper as you go deeper, we read in another report. In Siberia, rivers have always served as the safest path for people. But a Bakken, born in these parts, is so restive and so dangerous that only two or three daredevils, old timers hunters on boats, long as pikes, rise up the river close to the source. And the river is completely deserted. The first of the settlements, the village town of Abaza, lies 250 kilometers from the point we set. I'll run ahead and tell you. Coming back from the Tega, vegetable garden, we got into a bad weather and settled for a long time in the village of geologists, waiting for the helicopter. Everything you could do in the rain while idle was experienced. We took a steam bath four times, went to the Tega to drill camps several times, collected blueberries, took off chipmunks, caught grayling, fired a pistol into a tin can, told all these stories. And when it became too much, they gave a hint about the boat, which was docked in the backwater of a Bakken. A boat said the geologist, the head of the exploration. And if the journey ends with a morning frame and the signature group of comrades, what is it to you, but they will pull me to the prosecutor? Nikolai Astinovich and I retired in embarrassment. But on the 10th, it seems, a very rainy day, the word boat slowly surfaced. Okay, said the boss, let's take a chance. But I will sail with you. And we swam. Six people and 300 kilograms of cargo, a photographic chest, a barrel of gasoline, a spare motor, poles, an axe, life belts, raincoats, a bucket of salted grayling, bread, sugar, tea, everything was contained in a battered abaza boat. At the stern of the engine sat Voska Denisov, a driller, a dexterous, experienced guy, but still only a candidate for that limited number of fellows confidently passing the entire Bakken. Fear as big eyes, and perhaps the danger was not as great as newbies think. But chi chi, the sky has repeatedly seen us like a sheepskin in the literal and figurative sense. In the narrow Tega Canyon, a Bakken rushes, splitting into channels, creating heaps of washed out trees, boiling on stone rifts. Our boat for this river was a wooden toy that could be thrown on rocks, overturned on a rapids, pulled under the rubble of logs. The water in the river did not flow, it flew. At times, the fall of the stream was so steep that it seemed like the boat was rushing down the foam escalator. At such moments, we were all silent, remembering our relatives and friends. But praise to the helmsman, nothing happened. Oscar did not give a swing anywhere, he knew in which channel and at what second to turn, where to keep the speed at the limit, where to slow down, where to go on poles at all. I knew by name the boulders hidden under the water, on which chips were flying from many boats. As a transport route, the upper reaches of the Abakan River is dangerous and unreliable. But whoever once passed this road in the upper reaches will have a special starting point in understanding the wild, untouched beauty that people have touched so far only with the air. Nature smiled at us. We sailed half the way in the sun. 
The mountains surrounding the river exuded the smell of July needles, the rocky, lilac shore was full of flowers, the sky was piercing blue. The turns of the river hid, then revealed a series of mysterious hills, and at any moment the river could give us a Tega secret, a bear, Merrill, Alp could come out onto a rocky spit, a Kepikele could fly over the water. Everything is changeable in life. For more than a week, we cursed the weather, which did not allow a helicopter to approach us. Now we were grateful to the bad weather, which pushed us into the arms of a Bakken. The trip took two days with an overnight stay in the Tega winter quarters. But it seemed to us longer. 250 kilometers, and not a single human habitation. When we saw the first smoke over the chimney from the water, everyone yelled as if on command, Abaza. The first village on Abakan at that moment seemed to us the center of the universe. This was our return from the Tega after our meeting with the Lykovs. I began a short story about meeting people of extraordinary destiny from the end, so that one could feel and imagine how far they had gone from people and why they were discovered only by chance. We spent the night in Abaza and now we perceived this village town bordering the Tega in a completely new way. He really was the capital of this region. Several hundred boats, similar to the one on which we arrived from the Tega, were docked at the pier. They carry hay, firewood, mushrooms, berries, pine nuts here, they swim away to hunt and fish. On the bank of the pier, carpenters were building new boats. The old women came out here to sit on the benches, here in the evening couples walked, boys scampered around the boats, the guys tried and repaired the motors, but just like we, returning from the river, told us who saw what, what trouble we got into. The front gardens and vegetable gardens of cozy, solid Siberian buildings went straight to the pier. The apples were ripe near the houses. The gardens exuded the smell of some warm dill and some flowers. The resinous aroma of neatly laid firewood came from the houses. It was Saturday, and a bathhouse was smoking near every house. On the wide, tidy streets of the town, the calves and the jiguli were peacefully sharing the grass and asphalt. The posters announced the upcoming arrival of a famous film actor. And on the billboard, we read a leaflet without any surprise, I am changing housing in Leningrad for housing in Abaza. Miners, loggers, geologists and hunters live here. All of them loyally love the cozy, picturesque Abaza. Such is the village town at the edge of the Tega. We were looking for someone from those brave souls who went to the upper reaches of the river, to ask about the nature of those places, about everything that we did not have time or missed to learn from the Lykovs and geologists. We found the hunter Yuri Mogonikov at home. And we sat with him the whole evening. Tega is not poor there. A lot of things are growing, a lot of things are running, said the hunter, but it's still Tega. In the mountains, snow falls already in September and lasts until May. It can fall out and lie down for several days in June. In winter, the snow is waist deep and the frost is under 50. Siberia. Yuri heard about the Lykovs. And last year, for the sake of curiosity, I rose to their hall. When asked what he thinks about their life in the Tega, the hunter said that he loves the Tega, always goes to it with Joe, but with even greater joy I return here, to Abaza. To conceal your life in the Tega without people, without salt, without bread is a big mistake. Old man Lick of himself, I think, understood this blunder. We also asked how the Lykovs were able to climb so far up the Abokan, if today, having two very strong motors on the boat, only a few would dare to compete with the river. They led the boat with a rope and on poles. Before, everyone walked like that, though not far. But Karplikov, I understand, is of a special firm in Kurjik. Fast. It probably took about eight weeks that today I run in two days. And the helicopter took only two hours to get to the Tega Hole. At 10 in the morning they got up, and at 12 they were already looking for the landing site. For two hours we flew over the Tega, climbing higher and higher into the sky. The increasing height of the mountains forced this. Gentle and calm in the vicinity of Abaza, the mountains gradually became harsh and disturbing. The sun-drenched green affable valleys gradually began to narrow and at the end of the path turned into dark precipitous gaps with silvery threads of rivers and streams. We go to the point. The commander of the helicopter shouted in my ear. Light glass in the sun, a river sparkled in a dark hole, and a helicopter went over it, down, down. 
we sank onto the pebbles near the settlement of geologists. Until the Lykovsky dwelling, we knew, from here 15 kilometers up the river and then up the mountain. But a guide was needed. We had an agreement with him on the radio before our departure from Abaza. And now a hefty master driller, a hereditary Siberian Sidov Eurofis is on Tivich, and his comrades, a throwing swamp boots, backpacks, and a saw wrapped in sacking into the open door of the helicopter. And we are again in the air, rushing over a Bakken, repeating the bends of the river in a narrow gorge. It is impossible to sit at the Lykov's hut. She stands on the side of a mountain. And there is not, except for their garden, not a single bald spot in the taiga. There is, however, somewhere nearby a raised bog, which you cannot sit on, but you can hang low. Cautious pilots make circle after circle, trying on a clearing, on which water sparkles dangerously in the grass. During these visits, we see below the very same vegetable garden discovered from the air. Garden. Across the slope, lines of potato furrows, some other greenery. And next to it is a blackened hut. On the second call at the hut, they saw two figures, a man and a woman. Shielding their hands from the sun, they are watching the helicopter. The appearance of this machine means the appearance of people for them. We hovered over the swamp, left our luggage in the grass, jumped ourselves onto the cushions of damp moss. A minute later, without soaking its wheels in the swamp, the helicopter rose resiliently and immediately disappeared behind the wooded shoulder of the mountain. Silence. A deafening silence, well known to everyone who, like paratroopers, left the helicopter in half a minute like this. And here in the swamp Eurofi confirmed the sad news, which had already been heard in Abaza, there were only two people left in the Likov family, the grandfather and the youngest daughter Agafya. Three, Detroit, seven and Natalia, suddenly, almost one after another, died last autumn. Before it happened, five of us went out if they heard a helicopter. Now they saw themselves, too. Discussing with us the reasons for the unexpected death, the guide mistakenly took the wrong direction from the swamp, and we wandered in the taiga for two hours, believing that we were moving towards the hut, but it turned out that we were walking just from it. When they realized the mistake, they considered it a blessing to return to the swamp again and dance from here. An hour of walking along the path, already known to us from the stories of geologists, and here it is, the purpose of the journey, a hut, which has grown into the ground at the window, black with time and rain, furnished with poles on all sides, up to the very roof heaped up with household rubbish, boxes and twos from birch bark, firewood, hollowed out tubs and troughs and something else that is not immediately clear to a fresh air. In the residential world, this building under a large cedar would be mistaken for a bathhouse. But it was a dwelling that had stood here alone for about 40 years. Potato furrows running uphill with a ladder, a dark green island of hemp on potatoes, and a field of rye the size of a volleyball court gave the place, which had probably been reclaimed by a lot of work near the Tega, a peaceful inhabited look. People, however, were not visible. There was no barking of dogs, no cackling of chickens, or other sounds common to human habitation. A wild-looking cat, suspiciously studying us from the roof of the hut, jumped and threw a bullet into the hemp. Moreover, the porridge bird flew up and flew over the foamy stream. Karpa Sipovich. Is he alive? Called Yerofi, going up to the door, the top jam of which was below his shoulder. Something stirred in the hut. The door creaked and we saw an old man emerge in the sun. We woke him up. He rubbed his eyes, screwed up his eyes, ran his fingers along his disheveled beard, and finally exclaimed. Lord Arafe. The old man was clearly glad to meet, but did not shake hands with anyone. Approaching, he folded his palms near his chest and bowed to each of those who stood. And we waited, waited. It was decided that the fireman was a helicopter. And they fell asleep in sorrow. The old man also recognized Nikolai Ustinovich, who had been here a year ago. And this is a guest from Moscow. A friend of mine. He is interested in your life, said Irafi. The old man cautiously bowed in my direction. You are welcome, you are welcome. While Irafi was explaining where we sat and how foolishly we got lost, I could get a good look at the old man. It was no longer as homespun mossy as it was discovered and described by geologists. A felt had given by someone made him look like a beekeeper. Dressed in pants and a shirt of factory fabric. 
There are felt boots on the feet, a black scarf under the hat, protection from mosquitoes. Slightly hunched over, but for his 80 years old enough hard and mobile. Speech is intelligible, without the slightest flaws inherent in age. He often says, agreeing, eater eater. Which means, well, well. Slightly deaf, now and then he straightens his handkerchief near his ear and leans towards the interlocutor. But the look is attentive, tenacious. At the moment when the views of the harvest in the garden were discussed, the door of the hut opened slightly and Agafi ran out with a mouse, who did not hide her childhood joy from seeing people. Also palms joined together, bows to the belt. The machine flew, flew. And there are no good people and no. She said in a sing-song voice, dragging out her words. This is what the blessed people say. And it took a little getting used to so as not to get lost in the tone in which they usually speak with the blessed. It is impossible to judge the age of this woman by her appearance. The facial features of a person under 30, but the color of the skin is somehow unnaturally white and unhealthy, recalling the sprouts of potatoes that had been lying for a long time in the warm, damp darkness. Agafi was dressed in a baggy black shirt up to her feet. Bare feet. On his head is a black linen scarf. The people in front of us were covered in coal spots, as if they had just been cleaning pipes. It turned out that before our arrival, they continuously extinguished the Tega fire, which was approaching their very dwelling, for four days. The old man led us along the path behind the garden, and we saw, the trees were charred, the burnt blueberry crunched under our feet. And all this in, three stone throws, from the garden. June, which floods Moscow with rains, was dry and hot in the local forests. When the thunderstorms started, fires broke out in many places. Then the lightning struck the old cedar, and she got busy, like a candle. Fortunately, there was no wind, the resulting fire was approaching the dwelling along the ground. We poured the fire with water, covered with branches, covered with earth. And he is getting closer and closer, Agafya said. They are sure it was God who sent them a saving rain. And today the helicopter was also spinning at his direction. The machine woke us up. When she flew away, and you did not come, you lay down again. We've lost a lot of strength, said the old man. It's time to untie the backpacks. Gifts, the oldest way to show friendliness, were promptly received. The old man gratefully held out his hands, accepting a work suit, a cloth jacket, a box with a tool, a bundle of candles. Having said what the word was supposed to, and politely looking at everything, he wrapped each gift with a piece of birch bark and put it under the canopy. Later we found there many products of our clothing and rubber industry and a whole warehouse of hardware, everyone who came here brought something. We presented Agafia with stockings, fabric, sewing accessories. Thimble. She happily showed her father a metal cup. Even more joy was caused by an apron made of chintz, a scarf and red mittens sewn by an experienced woman's hand. Wishing to please us, Agafia covered the handkerchief over the one in which she slept and extinguished the fire and she walked like that all day. To our surprise, soap and matches were rejected, we can't do that. We heard the same thing when I opened a cardboard box with food delivered from Moscow. A little bit of everything, biscuits, bread, crackers, raisins, dates, chocolate, butter, canned food, tea, sugar, honey, condensed milk, everything was politely stopped by two palms in front of us. The old man took only a can of condensed milk in his hands and, after hesitating, put it on the heap, for cats. With great difficulty, we convinced them to take lemons, you definitely need it now. After asking, where does it grow? The old man framed the hem of his shirt, but told the gaffy to carry the lemons into the stream, let them lie there until evening. The next day we saw how the old man and his daughter, according to our instructions, squeezed lemons into a mug and smelled the crusts with curiosity. Then we received gifts. Agafi walked around us with a sack, pouring pine nuts into our pockets, brought a birch bark box with potatoes. The old man showed the place where you can light a fire, and, politely saying we cannot win asked to have a meal together, withdrew with Agafi to the hut to pray. While the potatoes were being cooked, I walked around the, like of Skoy estate. It was located at a carefully and, probably, not immediately chosen point. Away from the river and high enough on the mountain, the estate was safely hidden from any casual eye. 
The place was protected from the wind by the folds of the mountains and taiga. Next to the dwelling is a cold, clean stream. Larch, spruce, cedar and birch stands give people everything they could take here. The beast is not afraid of anyone. Blueberries and raspberries are nearby, firewood is nearby, cedar cones fall right on the roof of the house. Here is perhaps an inconvenience for the garden, not too gentle slope. But look how thick the potatoes are turning green. And the rye was already full, the pods on the peas were swollen. I suddenly stopped at the thought that I was looking at this hotbed of life through the eyes of a summer resident. But there is no train here. It is not an hour's journey to the nearest light, to a human handshake, but 250 kilometers of impassable taiga. And a person has not been here for 30 days, but for more than 30 years. What labor did you get bread and warmth here? Did you suddenly have a desire to gain wings and fly, fly, fly somewhere? Near the house, I carefully looked at the old trash. A spear with a large shaft and a homemade forge tip. A little hatchet worn out almost to the butt. A homemade axe, you can only chop off branches with it. Skis knocked out with a camas. Hose. Details of a weaving mill. A spindle with a stone spindle. Now all this has been dumped unnecessarily. Hemp was planted most likely out of habit. They brought fabrics here, they won't wear out for a long time. And a lot of other things are stuck under the roof and lies under a canopy near the stream, a coil of wire, five pairs of boots, sneakers, an enamel saucepan, a shovel, a saw, rubberized pants, a roll of tin, four sickles. If it's good, you won't live a century. Karpa Sipovich, who came up in his felt boots, sighed inaudibly. Taking off his hat, he prayed towards the two crosses. The kingdom of heaven, they no longer need sickles or axes. The old man showed me a storage shed on two high pillars, to protect food from mice and bears, a cellar where potatoes were kept, a hearth of stones at the very threshold of the hut, where Agafia was cooking dinner on a small fire. I got a good look at the roof of the shack. It was not sketched out in disarray, as it seemed at first. Large blocks looked like gutters and were laid like tiles on European houses. The nights in the mountains here are cold. We didn't have a tent. Agafia and her father, watching how we were going, in what God sent, to lie down near the fire, invited us to spend the night in a hut. The first day's impressions must be finished with its description. Bending under the jam of the door, we found ourselves in almost total darkness. The evening light was blue only in a window the size of two hands. When the gaffy lit and secured a torch in the light that stood in the middle of the dwelling, one could somehow make out the interior of the hut. The walls were dark even with the torch, the soot of many years did not reflect light. The low ceiling was also charcoal dark. Bowls for drying clothes hung horizontally from the ceiling. Flush with them along the walls were shelves lined with birch bark utensils with dried potatoes and pine nuts. Down along the walls were wide benches. On them, as could be understood by some rags, they slept and could now sit. To the left of the entrance, the main place was occupied by a wild stone stove. The pipe from the stove, also made of stone tiles, faced with clay and strapped with birch bark, exited not through the roof, but from the side of the wall. The stove was small, but it was a Russian stove with a two-stage top. On the lower step, on a bed of dry marsh grass, the head of the house slept and sat. Above, large and small birch bark boxes were again piled up. To the right of the entrance stood another stove on legs, a metal one. The bent pipe also went away from it through the wall. In winter it was possible to freeze wolves here. Well, they cooked this potbelly stove for them. I am surprised how they dragged, said Eurofi, who had spent the night here more than once. In the middle of the dwelling was a small table, worked by an axe. That's all there was. But it was crowded. The area of the kennel was about seven steps by five, and one could only guess how six adults of both sexes huddled here for many years. We're in distress. The old man and Agafi talked without tension and with pleasure. But often the conversation was interrupted by their impulses to pray immediately. Turning into a corner where, apparently, there were icons invisible in the dark, the old man and his daughter sang prayers loudly, groaned, sighed noisily, fingering the hillocks of the ladders, the instrument, on which the bows were counted. 
The prayer ended abruptly as it began, and the conversation flowed again from the point where it had been interrupted. At the appointed hour, the old man and his daughter sat down to dinner. They ate potatoes, dipping them in coarse salt. He just carefully collected grains of salt from their knees and put them in a salt shaker. Agafia asked the guests to bring their own mugs and poured cedar milk into them. The drink, prepared in cold water, resembled milk tea in color and was perhaps delicious. Agafia made it in front of our eyes, she ground the nuts in a stone mortar, mixed them with water in a birch bark dish, filtered them. Agafia had no idea of purity. The earthy colored rag through which the food was squeezed served the hostess at the same time for wiping her hands. But what could be done, we drank the milk and, giving Agafia obvious pleasure, sincerely praised the drink. After supper, questions about the bath somehow spontaneously arose. The Lykovs did not have a bath. They didn't wash. We can't do that, said the old man. Agafia corrected her grandfather, saying that she and her sister occasionally washed in a dugout trough, when it was possible to warm the water in the summer. They also occasionally washed their clothes in the same water, adding ash to it. Neither broom nor broom has ever touched the floor in the hut. The floor bounced underfoot. And when Nikolai Astinovich and I were spreading an army raincoat tent on it, I took a pinch of the cultural layer to examine outside the door by the light of a flashlight what it consists of. The carpet on the floor consisted of potato husks, pine nut husks and a hemp fire. On this soft floor, without undressing, we lay down, putting our backpacks under our heads. Irofi, stretched out to his full height on the bench, relatively soon announced with a snore that he was sleeping. Karpasipovich, not parting with his felt boots, lay down, slightly breaking the grass feather bed with his hands on the stove. Agafi put out the torch and curled up, without undressing, between the table and the stove. Contrary to expectations, no one ran on our bare feet and tried to drink blood. Moving away from people here, the Lykovs managed, probably, to slip away unnoticed from the eternal companions of man, for whom the absence of a bath, soap and warm water would be prosperity. Or maybe hemp played a role. In our village, I remember, hemp was used against fleas and bedbugs. Already the window began to glow palely with the July morning light, and I still did not sleep. In addition to people, two cats with seven kittens were found in the house, for whom the night is the best time to take walks in all the nooks and crannies. The bouquet of smells and the staleness of the air were so high that it seemed as if a spark flashed here by chance, and everything would explode scatter in the sides of the logs and birch bark. I could not resist, crawled out of the hut to breathe. There was a big moon over the taiga. And the silence was absolute. Leaning my cheek against the cold wood pile, I thought, will all this be real? Yes, everything was real. Karpasipovich came out to urinate. And we stood with him for a quarter of an hour talking about space travel. I asked, does Karpasipovich know that there were people on the moon, walked there and rode in chariots? The old man said that he had heard about it many times, but he did not believe it. The month is a divine light. Who, except gods and angels, can fly there? And how can you walk and ride upside down? Taking a breath of air, I fell asleep for two hours. And I clearly remember a difficult, confused dream. In the Lykov's hut there is a huge color television. And on his screen, Sergei Bondarkuk in the image of Pierre Bazukov is holding a discussion with Karpasipovich about the possibility of a man visiting the moon. I woke up from an unusual sound. Outside the door, Eurofi and the old man were sharpening an axe on a stone. Even in the evening we promised the Lykovs to help in matters with the hut, the construction of which they began when there were five more of them. Please share this video on your social networks, using the buttons under the video and subscribe to the channel. I ask you to go and watch other videos about Agafya Lykova, which you can see now on the screen in the end screen savers. There are a lot of rare and interesting facts about the hermit. Thank you all for watching.